that so noble an intellect could have spent 22 years pursuing fabulous shadows in Egyptian crypts? If, as some have asserted, Osiris signified merely the Nile, and Isis, the black earth, rendered fertile by its inundation, could such a fable have so greatly stimulated the admiration of Pythagoras that he would have spent a score of years in the assimilation of the idea? I don't think so. Or again, would he have spent this great length of time, the very best years of his life, in memorizing the myth-encrusted history of an ancient king who at some remote period had reigned in Egypt and whose memory seemed sufficient to inspire a vast civilization for some six thousand years. By the way, that's the exact number of years in the calendar of the mystery school and of the Freemasons. Or would he approach the matter from another of these explanations? Would Pythagoras have pounded himself for a score of years against the walls of Memphis and find himself fully rewarded by being informed with bated breath by some archi magus that Isis is the dog star? I think not. It's not impossible that in the course of its long and illustrious history, folks, Egypt devised many opinions relative to her sacred myths, but no such explanation has involved Egypt alone. Her histories, her heroes, or her agricultural problems could have caused illustrious men from all parts of the world to have visited her in quest of essential wisdom, the central core of which is the myth of Osiris, Isis, and Horus, known as the Osirian cycle. The Nile meant nothing to the Greeks, who cared little whether it rose or fell. The sneezing you hear in the background is my dog, Sugar Bear, who always accompanies me into the studio to do these programs. Not Egypt, but the Umbos of Delphi was the center of their universe in Greece and local fables derived from Egypt's 42 gnomes could never have won for the double empire its illustrious reputation as patron of all learning, human and divine. So we must look deeper. And look deeper we did, folks. And what we found is amazing. For we found that Osiris and Isis and Horus were not ever have meant to be, nor were they ever real people, or real gods, or spacemen who came from some other world. Not at all. As we have found in our research, and as I have found in my over 20 some odd years of research into the mystery schools, they are like all the other symbols of the mystery religion. For the public, for the profane, they are the exoteric and you may make of them what you wish the adepts, the initiates, the priests they don't care what interpretation you give the exoteric meaning and the esoteric is so entirely different from what you may suspect that the answer will surprise you you see we cannot be deceived by the obvious and you can never be deceived by the obvious or even consider the obvious when looking at any of the mystery religions or the secret doctrine. And we cannot allow ourselves to be misdirected by the evident subterfuges, the deceptions of these ancient priests who so carefully concealed their arcana from the uninitiated world that we at this late time may even doubt its existence. Yet now, today, it is thriving to the point that it controls all levels of our society, military, and government. The ignorant, the sheeple, even among the Egyptians, might derive their inspiration from the processionals and rituals of the state religion, but that's just for the sheeple. For those great philosophers who came from afar were in search of the highest form of human knowledge, the ancient arts, the secrets of the ages, 
and could not be satisfied by such outer show? Had these fables been but hollow and unsubstantial forms, Egypt would have been the ridicule of the wise who would speedily have exposed her sham and reduced her vain pretense to a humble state. But this did not occur. You see, the initiates of her mysteries returning to their own countries not only felt themselves more than repaid for their hazardous journeys and long vigils, but furthermore, they became founders of distinguished systems of thinking, disseminators of useful knowledge, and in all cases bore witness to a broad and deep learning, and they always took with them a plan, a plan for the unfoldment of a world utopian government which plan still exists today and is still being carried out in secret as the completion of the great work. Neodorus describes two famous columns erected near Nysa in Arabia, one to Isis and the other to Osiris. Now remember, Osiris and Isis never lived, they were not re real people, and they were never gods. They are symbols for something much deeper. So when you listen to the interpretation of the inscriptions on the columns, remember that. The column to Isis bears this inscription, quote, I am Isis, queen of this country. I was instructed by Mercury. No one can destroy the laws which I have established. I am the eldest daughter of Saturn, the most ancient of gods. I am the wife and sister of Osiris the king. I first made known to mortals the use of wheat. I am the mother of Horus the king. In my honor was the city of Bubastus built. Rejoice, O Egypt, rejoice land that gave me birth." Unquote. The column to Osiris bore these words, quote, I am Osiris the king who led my armies into all parts of the world to the most thickly inhabited countries of India, the north, the Danube, and the ocean. I am the eldest son of Saturn. I was born of a brilliant and magnificent egg and my substance is of the same nature as that which composes light. There is no place in the universe where I have not appeared to bestow my benefits and make known my discoveries." Unquote. And the rest of the inscription, of course, was destroyed. Now, while the inscription on the pillar, or the obelisk in honor of Isis, may be veiled, the inscription on the obelisk dedicated to Osiris is certainly not. He was born of a brilliant and man magnificent egg, and his substance is of the same nature of that which composes light. There is no place in the universe where I have not appeared. Osiris, of course, was the sun. In examining Plutarch's treatise, the introductory remarks appear of special significance. Yet, folks, these remarks are wholly ignored by Egyptologists who are content to confine themselves entirely to the fable which constitutes the larger part of the writing. If Plutarch, by any word or symbol, reveals even a small part of the sacred mystery, it is to be found in the following words, quote, For Isis, according to the Greek interpretation of the word, signifies knowledge as does the name of her professed adversary, Typhon, signify insolence and pride. A name, therefore, extremely well adapted to one who, full of ignorance and error, tears in pieces and conceals that holy doctrine which the goddess collects, compiles, and delivers to those who aspire after the most perfect participation of the divine nature. Now, if you have a keen intellect you can all decipher everything else that I'm going to tell you on this program and probably the next one in that short paragraph. And I'll let you ponder that as I continue. Osiris, the black god of the Nile, 
must be regarded as the personification of an order of learning. For Plutarch identifies him beyond question with the holy doctrine or the mystery tradition. Now remember I told you Osiris is the symbol of the sun.